can have a seat. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everybody. Um, it was uh, about, um, boy, about now, about maybe 20 years ago, it was the first time that I had ever taken uh, a group of students to West Africa with me on a mission trip. I had been going there for a number of years by myself. I had learned kind of all of the ins and outs and things you needed to do. I would finally convinced a whole lot of parents that they could trust me to take their children uh, to the other side of the world. One of the things that we had to continually keep reminding students uh, of was you've got to take your anti-malaria medication. You do not want to get malaria. From everything we knew and heard and learned, it was not a fun uh, sickness to get. So it was our last night of being there. We were uh, staying in, in kind of these, these rest houses. Uh, so I was in a room with all of the guys. And at about 3 a.m. in the morning, I woke up, my eyes opened, and I knew something was terribly wrong with myself, uh, which is what people have been telling me for years. Uh, but I, I, I knew something was wrong because the only thing that I could move were my eyelids. And my head was pounding, uh, the worst headache that I'd ever experienced, and my body was trembling with the chills. It was about 80 degrees in the room, but I was absolutely freezing cold to the point I was shaking so badly I was paralyzed. I couldn't move at all. And I thought to myself, well, what I need to do is I need to get the attention of another one of the guys in the room to try to wake them up because I know that I need help. But there was nothing I could do. I couldn't move. I couldn't move my arms. Uh, I couldn't speak. Uh, I was having trouble, just shallow breathing. And I just laid there trying to think to myself, how in the world am I going to, to get anybody to notice uh, that I'm in trouble? I, I, I realized very quickly, one, nobody was going to wake up. I, I couldn't even think enough to make noise enough loud loud enough to get anybody to wake up, I just decided I, I have to just lay here, suffer through this thing uh, until, until the sun comes up, right? And, and when the sun rises, people are going to wake up and somebody hopefully will notice me uh, and get me some help. It's the only thing I could hope for. I couldn't change what was happening in my body. I had a parasite that was now in my blood and was causing and wreaking all sorts of havoc. It was going to take some serious medication, some treatment. I knew what was wrong because I had recognized over the, the last couple of weeks that everybody else's malaria medication was going down. And mine, uh, I, I looked one day and, oh, that's right. I, I, I forgot. I forgot to take it that day and that day and that day. So I knew what the problem was and I knew that I needed to help. I wasn't going to be able to will it away. Uh, that, that's for sure. I wasn't going to be able to just go, well, you know what, if I, if I would just think to myself that maybe, maybe malaria doesn't exist, that it would somehow go away. There was a problem, and it needed to get solved, and I needed help. And so my focus for the next couple of hours was really just on that window outside, hoping that when the sun would rise... So would everyone else, uh, and they would get me help. The Friday that Jesus was crucified was an incredibly dark day. We read about it in all four Gospels. I want to just share with you today as I've taken kind of all four narratives that have been told about that day and put them together for us to understanding the weight of it. Last week we talked about Palm Sunday. Uh, and so on that day, on Lamb Selection Day, there was a crowd, maybe by the thousands that were standing on the road outside of Jerusalem, proclaiming Jesus as King. Fast forward now to uh, that fateful day when the crowd had turned on Jesus and now all of a sudden they're crying to crucify Him. They want His blood. The mass was now willing to, to ask for an exchange of Barabbas, the thief, for Jesus, the innocent. When the, when the crowd was asked by Pontius Pilate what he should do with, with Jesus, because Pontius knew that Jesus was innocent. He'd done nothing wrong. And 
to kind of add to the weight of his guilt, Pontius Pilate's wife actually came to him and said, Hey, honey, uh, you know that guy that you have that people want him dead? I had a dream about him last night, uh, and I know that he's innocent. And the things I saw in my dream of what are going to happen to us if we allow him to get murdered are really bad. So please, I am begging you, spare his life. Pontius goes before the people and says, I don't know what to do with this innocent man. What should I do? And in surprise, the crowd just yells out, crucify him. Kill him. It doesn't make any sense to Pilate at all. But he allows it to take place. And there is Jesus. An innocent man is beaten and he's whipped and he's spit upon. And he's mocked, made fun of. He's bloody. And he's nailed to a cross. And they drop that cross on top of a hill that is called the place of the skull. Could it get any darker? And he did it all without a fight. Scripture tells us at about 3 p.m. That, that Jesus is struggling to breathe. He cries out, first of all, to God, why have you forsaken me? And, and then, he, then he makes the claim that his work on this earth is done. That, that he did exactly what he came to do. That God had sent him into this world to live as an innocent man. To be the sacrificial lamb. To pay the price for all of our sins. That we all deserve death. We all deserve an eternity separated from God. And apart from him we deserve eternal punishment from a holy God. Because we are unholy people. And the only thing that could save us would be the blood of the perfect lamb, and Jesus said, I'll go and I will be that. And he didn't fight it, and he allowed himself to go on that cross with no, as Scripture says, no, no words spoken, no violence on his part, no fight. He laid down his life so that God would be made known to each and every one of us. And it says that, that as soon as he breathed his last breath, middle of the afternoon, darkness fell on the earth. The sun disappears. Then all of a sudden the earth starts to quake. And the rocks begin to split in half. You can imagine having never even thought of anything like this before. That this Passover crowd that was there. As we talked about last week. Possibly in the millions. Watching what is taking place. Probably running for shelter. Terrified and scared. Of what's happening in the dark. Scripture goes on to say that when the sun failed to shine, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. And recognizing that Jesus was dead, to add insult to injury, the soldiers that had crucified him grabbed a spear and ran it through his side. It says that blood and water were separated. They, it poured out of him showing that he was officially dead. There's no question about it. There's a man named Joseph, a wealthy man, who has a, a tomb reserved for himself and his family. It's never been used before, and he cares about Jesus so much that he goes to Pilate and he asks for Jesus' body. Let me take care of him. So uh, he uh, is allowed to take Jesus' body back to the tomb. He's joined by one of Jesus' followers who was also a Pharisee who had turned his life over to Christ named Nicodemus says that Nicodemus brought over a hundred pounds of spices. Scripture tells us they had to get Jesus buried off the cross and buried quickly because the Sabbath was about to take place and you, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. So they just need to get his body into the tomb and a hundred pounds of spices is more than enough. Five pounds was really all that you that was required that you place in a tomb for a king. Jesus got over a hundred pounds. Because Nicodemus knew that we, they weren't going to, to be able to embalm his body to really prepare it for, for death there in the tomb for days until the Sabbath was over. And so maybe a hundred pounds out of his love, but also his respect. I don't want people to have to experience the foul stench of death. There were 
A number of women, Jesus' followers, that followed them to the tomb that day and watched what took place. They saw his body put into the tomb and they took it upon themselves that, that after the Sabbath was over that they would go to the tomb, that they would prepare the spices and that they would have the honor of caring for the body of their fallen leader. But everybody had to get back home because the Sabbath was coming. They needed to get back to their religious routine. So the stone is placed in front of the tomb and they go home. Now, we're not told in Scripture what takes place between uh, that evening when Jesus' body is left there in the tomb and the morning when the women arrive at the tomb, but we could probably fill in some blanks. I imagine that on that Sabbath day, there's there's a lot of emptiness in the hearts and the minds of the disciples. I'm sure that that even in the the city of Jerusalem, there's so much conversation about the earthquake that took place, the darkness that fell on the earth that had never been seen before. The crucifixion that took place. For three years, three years, the disciples had committed their lives to being with Jesus every minute that they possibly could. To learn from Him and to grow from Him. Wherever He went, it was because of Him that their meals were provided, that shelter was provided for them. There's got to be so much confusion and so much loss that's going on in their minds. They had been there. They'd heard Every sermon preached, they had seen the miracles that he had done. They had claimed him as the Savior of the world, and now he's gone. And I'm sure that they're questioning absolutely everything. They had trusted him with their lives. They loved him deeply, and he loved them deeply, like nobody ever had. But when he was arrested, Scripture says that they scattered they disappeared. We actually, during the, the, the telling of the crucifixion in the Gospels, we only know of maybe one or two of the disciples that's recorded of actually being there. The others, Scripture says, were locked behind a door in a hidden room because they didn't want to happen to them what had happened to Jesus. They were terrified. Peter denied knowing him. Judas went out and hung himself. How do you begin to even process all that you have just experienced and been witness to? It's interesting that, that the soldier in charge of killing Jesus, the one who put him on the cross, put the nails in his hand, the one that ran the sword, uh, the spear through his side, the one that proclaimed that he was dead, when it all went dark and the earth shook and the rock split, he was the only one who preached the message. He said, Surely this man was the Son of God. What would that do to you as a follower of Jesus who you you said, I will follow you wherever you go. I will proclaim your name everywhere you go. I trust in who you are. And as soon as the tough times come and you watch what happens, they scatter. And the only preacher is the guy that actually ran the sword through the side of the Savior. Surely this man was the Son of God. John tells us that the disciples found shelter, locked the doors. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders coming for them next. says that when the women found them in that room, three days later, when they came to tell the story of what had taken place at the tomb, it says that they found the men weeping and mourning. That's where they were at. It was dark. Mark 8 and 9 tell us that Jesus on three separate occasions made it extremely clear to his disciples about what was going to take place. He said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of his enemies. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be killed. And I will rise again. Mark 8 says that when when Peter heard it, Peter stood up and got in Jesus' face and says he actually rebuked him. Don't you dare say anything like that. We would never allow something like that to happen. You are the Messiah. Nothing like that could ever happen to you. 
It wasn't going to take place. The second and third time Mark says that the disciples' response was, was that they didn't understand what he was talking about. And it says, and they were too afraid to ask him to explain it. Nobody wanted to be the one. As a good disciple, a follower of a good rabbi, you should always know what your rabbi is talking about. Or eventually he's going to explain it to you. And so nobody was going to raise their hand and be kind of the, the one that says, hey, what do you mean by that? They just had to pretend that they knew. But they didn't ask him what he meant. What do you mean you're going to get arrested and die and rise again? It says they were just too ashamed to ask. They didn't want to look foolish or ignorant. So instead of trusting and then seeing it all take place and remembering what it is that Jesus had told them, they chose to run and, and to live in fear and to live with guilt and to lie and to hide and to deny everything that they had known instead of just digging deeper. What's this all about? What's interesting is that with all that Jesus had said about what was going to take place, None of the disciples anticipated the resurrection. You would think that, that dying on that cross and the, the trauma that, would, that you would experience of watching that take place, of knowing your friend and the innocent leader being put on that cross, would, you would instantly, you know what, he said something about this. And he said we don't have to fear because he said he's going to rise again. But when you experience death and look at it, just look death in the face. Everything else just goes away. And they ran. It's interesting that, again, the only ones that remembered what Jesus said about the resurrection were his enemies. It was the Pharisees and the scribes that were told that, that said, hey, do you remember that when he was out teaching, he talked about rising from the dead? We should probably do something about that. We should secure that tomb. We should put soldiers out in front of that tomb to make sure that it doesn't happen. And also, we don't want his disciples getting in there and taking the body and making the, the claim that he rose from the dead. So let's make sure that this resurrection can't happen. They're the only ones that remembered what it is that he had to say. It wasn't a thought in the disciples' mind. In John chapter 12, Jesus is is pondering, he's thinking about what's about to happen and what's going to take place. And he's in a crowd, but, but he's overwhelmed by it, and he just begins to cry out to God. Really this idea of, does it really have to happen this way? If it's going to glorify you, then, then I'll give up my life and I'll trust you with it. And it says in John chapter 12 that with an audible voice from heaven, God speaks. And basically says, yes, this is how I will glorify myself. Everybody heard it. People began to, to freak out about what it is that they heard. But their response to Jesus in, in it was, well, what we know from our scriptures is that the Son of Man is going to live forever. So if you're going to die, you must not be the Son of Man. Because how in the world could you live forever and Jesus says to them this light because I'm the light of the world and this light you're only going to have here for a little while so walk while you have the light because anyone who walks in darkness is lost he says believe in the light but they still didn't believe in him and, and and I think one of the greatest truths that we can understand from this is that the greatest darkness that we could have in our lives, that we could choose for ourselves, is to not believe. The, the, the weight and the shadow of, of what this life is even about, and we look at this world and think that everything is falling apart and our life isn't great. Is there anything to hope in? Yes, there is, but you've got to believe in the light of the world. Because to not believe, to choose to not believe, to choose to not dig a little bit deeper, to find out more about the answer to why we are here on this earth is the greatest darkness of all. 
to be blind to the truth, to choose that that's been made known for us. Proverbs 21.16 says, A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. In other words, if we, if we hear the knowledge of the truth and we choose to, to go against it, if we reject it, I know that our world says what's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me, but that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says there is only one truth, and if you don't know it, then you will be lost forever, wandering in darkness for all of eternity. Because Colossians 2.13 says that we are dead in our sin. Our own selfishness that separates us from God, a one true holy God, puts us in a position that there is absolutely nothing that we can do for redemption. There's nothing we can do to make it right. And Jesus says, but I'm the light. I'm the one who conquers death, conquered your sin, and who gives you life. But if we choose to not believe, we will forever, for all of eternity, walk in darkness. Our text today is in, found in uh, the book of Luke, chapter 24. Don't panic. We're, I'm not, that wasn't my intro. All right? So I, I just... I wanted us to understand, I wanted us to look at, at the difficult and the dark and the struggle so that we could truly embrace the light and the great news of what today, Resurrection Sunday, is all about. Here at Century, we stand in reading of the Word. Let's do that. Stretch your legs a little bit. Here's what, uh, what Luke writes. This is... This is incredibly good news. But on that first day of the week, I love that he starts with that word, but. Because we've just talked about darkness. We know that that's what people are feeling. The women had gone to the tomb and watched Jesus' body be put away, but they had to get home because it was the Sabbath. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb, and they told all of these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not want to believe them. But Peter rose, ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. That's God's Word. Let's have a seat. Let me talk about the light. Just a few things to point out from this incredible morning that changed history. First of all, it didn't click with the women right away. They were perplexed by it. They were confused. Nobody had come to the tomb with, with a hopeful expectation no conversation about, well, I hope he's not there. They just went to take care of business, to honor Jesus, to embalm their past friend. When they got there, the storm was rolled away. Jesus is gone. They're confused, frightened. We read in the other Gospels, that's what, that's what they proclaimed. Somebody's taken him. We don't know where it is that they've gone. And they're frightened. But the angel appears and asks this incredibly powerful question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why, why, are you, why are you here? What are you doing in a grave? He's not here. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. It's, it's an incredibly powerful question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I've heard it said that, that what, what was taking place was a redirection. The angels were redirecting 
their hearts and their minds from feeling to truth. Because that's all that, 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 that the, they've been wrestling with. Fear. Probably guilt. Why don't we do something for him? Why don't we stand up for him? Shame. Maybe doubt. Was he really who he said he was? They're heartbroken. They saw him die. But the truth was, he was alive. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And then the angel says, don't you remember? Don't you remember what he told you? That he was going to have to die. But that he also would rise again. Remember. And now see the proof. So they run to the disciples and they testify everything that had happened. We got to go find the guys. We got to let them know. And actually we're told that as they are running to go and find the disciples, that Jesus actually meets the women on the road and, and, and they fall down at his feet and begin to worship him. They understand who he is. They understand that he truly is the Savior. He, they understand that he has defeated death. But the disciples didn't believe. It seemed like an idle tale. Those disciples, what was it going to take to get through to them? Ah, I don't, we, don't, we don't believe you. I find it interesting that the disciples had a hard time with all that they had known, all that Jesus had told them, and they didn't believe. I mean, who, I guess I get it, who rises from the dead? They had seen it with Lazarus. They had heard about it in a couple other instances, but it was always Jesus touching somebody, Jesus calling somebody out of the tomb. How, how could somebody who's dead rise from the dead? Only Jesus can make that happen. And so, how could it be? But Peter, Peter wants to see for himself, and so he runs with great anticipation to the tomb, saw for himself that Jesus wasn't there, and his reaction said, this is what I love. R remember, they, they had locked themselves uh, up in a room behind locked doors so that nobody could find them, keeping themselves in the dark out of fear and guilt and shame. And when Peter saw an empty tomb, he didn't see Jesus. He saw an empty tomb that he, and believed that he had risen from the dead. And it says that Peter went home marveling at what happened. He didn't go back to the locked room. He, he didn't go back into hiding. He stepped out in public. He didn't care. It doesn't matter what anybody's going to do to me because Jesus is alive. And, and he's given me a reason to live. I wonder if today there aren't some of us in this room that haven't truly accepted the truth of God's word and what he says about himself, his promises, his love, his gift. Has, had Jesus' followers remembered what he had said, that he was going to conquer death, they could have looked upon that cross and just said, you wait until Sunday morning. You wait and see what's going to happen. And bow down in worship at the Lamb who sacrificed Himself upon that throne to draw all people uh, to Himself. Because as dark as it was, they could always remember, but He said He was going to rise. So, so let's just wait for the sunrise. Because it's going to happen. And when that takes place, the problem with our blood is fully taken care of. We're given new life. I wonder how many of us look at the circumstances of today. What's happening in our country, what's happening in our world, and we just throw our hands up and we are terrified about what's going to happen next. Wars and rumors of wars, murders taking place, a rejection of the truth. There's identity confusion. There's racism that's running rampant through our country. We think everything, all is lost. There's no hope for us whatsoever. It is way 
too dark. There is no reason for us to have hope. It's what caused Jesus' followers to go into hiding. They gave up. They didn't think that that God was strong enough, was powerful enough to change their world. But the words of the angel were, why do you... Why do you think you're going to find living among the dead? Why do you think you're going to find the answers in the graves? He's not here. And I think we need to, to hear that same thing. Why, why, do, why do we panic when we see our world falling apart? Why are we looking for truth among the dead? Why are we looking for the living among the graves? This world is in decay, and it will continue to decay until Christ returns. What we need to be is the living among the dead. We need to be the ones that bring the hope of salvation and resurrection to people rather than walking around as though Jesus is still in the tomb. He is alive and he said, because I'm alive, you can live too in spite of all of the darkness that's around you because you now are the light of the world. So go and shine your light. Jesus dying on the cross Going to that grave, that was no accident. That was designed by God the Father for it to take place. And so was the resurrection. If he could take care of that, you can entrust all of your struggles and problems to him. And he promises that he will walk you through it. As Jesus said in John 16, 33, don't be afraid because I've already overcome the world. And he proved it by doing the one thing that nobody else could. He conquered the grave. And he says, if you believe in me, in who I am, if you proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Yes, that upon your death on this earth, that you, if you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will rise again and you have nothing to fear. But also you're given life over death now, today, that we don't have to walk around in fear and guilt and shame because the grave is empty. And that promise can live within us. Jesus' first words to his disciples when he went and found them John chapter 20 is he walks in the room and and he says, peace to you. Peace. Because he knows what they're going through. And he knows what their struggle is. He doesn't come and say, why do you guys help me? Where'd you guys go? Why do you keep doing this all the time? He just said, I did this so that you could have peace. So embrace it. As I close, just... One, one, one thing that's really interesting in, in the, the resurrection story that, that really doesn't ever get talked about is that when Jesus breathed his last on Golgotha and the earth shook and the sky went dark and the rocks split, it says also that all of the tombs outside of Jerusalem opened up. But it says that it wasn't until Jesus rose from the dead that all of the bodies of the saints that are inside of those tombs came out went into Jerusalem and began to proclaim the truth to the people. Because Scripture says that Jesus is the firstborn among the dead. He rises first, and because of his resurrection, his saints will rise as well. We know that. We know that that because of Jesus, one day we'll rise again, that death is defeated, that we are given new life. But I would say that today we take the truth of the resurrection and we rise We rise up out of this grave that we keep burying ourselves in of the woe is me and all woe is what's going on in the world. And we be the ones to proclaim the truth with great joy that Jesus is alive and wants to offer life to others. For us here in North Dakota, we have been waiting desperately for this winter to end. I've talked to so many people like, oh, it's miserable. People are angry and grumpy and depressed because of all that's going on. We just need the sun to come out, and it changes everything, and that's the truth that we're learning today. Things might seem tough in your own life, whatever is going on, remember the sunrise. Jesus rose to give us life, 
not to, to make us comfortable, but to help us to understand that we don't have to fear, we don't have to live in guilt, that we are no longer dead in our sins. Because he went to the cross, and he went to the grave, and he rose from the grave to give us life. So that we could live today and forever. First Peter 2, 9. You're a people for his own possession. That you would proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Faith is not believing in the unbelievable. Faith is trusting in the promise that death has been defeated, that the tomb is empty, and that every day... The sun will rise. Let's pray. Jesus, today we proclaim your name loudly. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Son of God that willingly and humbly came to this earth, innocent of any wrongdoing, but you laid yourself down on that cross to take our punishment of our sin, knowing full well that it was going to be a struggle but also knowing that, that you would come out of that grave and you would defeat the enemy and you would defeat death. Today we praise you for that. Help us to remember that. Help us to walk in that each and every day with incredible joy, proclaiming that no matter what happens in the world, the one thing that we can claim is that he is risen. Amen. Let's stand and close in worship.